The Canadian Wild Turkey Federation presents Turkey Talk <laughs> with your hosts, the guys that keep it real. From the real outdoor experience, it's Carlin Riley and Ian McCleary. Stay tuned, folks. We discuss way more than just turkey hunting tips and tricks. If conservation, protection, and enhancement of the outdoors is important to you, you have come to the right place. It's go time. Three, two, one, let's go. Hi, everybody. It's Carlin and Ian from the Real Outdoor Experience. You are listening to the CWTF's Turkey Talk podcast. Today, we have Liam Morum and Mike Finley from an Urban Outdoorsman podcast. Welcome, guys. Great to have you hey. on the show. Thanks, guys. Here. Super happy to be here. So you guys are both born and raised in Toronto. Correct. Yes, you are. You started this Urban Outdoorsman podcast because you had a zest to get outdoors, but you didn't really know how to do it, where to go, who to uh, hook up with. Tell us a little bit about the story. Yeah. So, you know, when you start hunting, there's a lot of barriers to entry. And thankfully, in the internet age, you can learn a lot more on your own uh, than you would have been in a position to like 20 years ago. You can, you can kind of use the internet as your mentor, but when you look at the hunting media content that's available, a lot of it assumes a baseline level of knowledge that we just don't have. Like I, I remember reading like fishing magazine articles and I'm like, oh yeah, I know some of these words, you know, it was just ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. And also I kind of felt that a lot of hunting media was really aimed at like not people who live in a city and don't know what they're doing, but want to learn. Right. Um, there didn't seem to be a lot of, of voices like ours. It seemed to be a lot of, you know, old, it was like older, more rural, um, none, none of which is bad, but which no. didn't really speak to us or certainly didn't speak to me. So we thought, man, they let anybody do this. We'll just, <laughs> we'll just start a <laughs> podcast. Any idiot can do this. Well, yeah. right. Because we were still learning at the time. Like, and so we started contacting people and people have been super generous with us. And for us, it was a learning tool as well because we weren't, we hadn't developed a huge amount of expertise and we still haven't, frankly. Um, we still saw, we're, probably, we're probably worse than something now. Than yeah, but you know what? As, <laughs> as they say, like be brave enough to suck at something new, right? Exactly. And so <laughs> that was that was part of our sucking at, like <laughs> sucking at hunting included <laughs> sucking at podcasting and we've slowly gotten better at both over time yeah <laughs> embrace the suffering yeah exactly it's not like a buddhist mindset for, for hunting. <laughs> podcasting so life is suffering but liam i think uh, I, I read online somewhere that one of your favorite activities is missing birds or missing things you're shooting at oh yeah i'm the best non-hitting guy you'll meet yeah <laughs> nothing nothing's better than a turkey story where you miss come on oh. no one wants to hear a turkey story where you where you succeed that's not fun <laughs> that just gets me angry <laughs> <laughs> I want to, I want to hear all the, the bad stories, right? Yeah. No, exactly. I'm, I'm just messing. Um, I mean, yeah, like the thing, the thing about, I think that we got into hunting really, like the, really the reason that I mean, I don't know about you, Mike, the reason I got into hunting was really because of meat eater initially, right. The meat eater TV show. Um, but again, geared toward American audience, you know, big game hunting mainly, you know, uh, like mountain, you know, Western, us hunting and then you're like oh i'm in ontario i'm in southern ontario where yeah. <laughs> it's just forests and and highways and there's none of that but then the turkey episodes came out and i remember watching it and being like whoa there's turkeys here i've seen turkeys this is like you know we can hunt those okay and then you know then the obsession began for right there, right that's that's fantastic it that's uh that's exactly why we started the real outdoor experience you know they're watching uh tv hunting shows since i was little uh, now my story is a little different and so as Ian's we had mentors we grew up hunting so it was something right. that uh, you know that was it's part of us um, but uh, you know watching Jim Shockey and uh, he goes on these crazy adventures and mm -hmm. you know goes to all over the world and and uh, hunts amazing animals and amazing climates and you know views and it's very picturesque but for for little old me in Ontario, that's, that's not something that I'm going to have the opportunity to do just because, you know, financial, uh, you know, those hunts are huge dollars. And, um, 
I like to spend time with my family. So uh, there's a sacrifice. I, and, and Jim has said many times in his shows, you know, I'm out here hunting away from my family. And uh, there, there is that sacrifice, but it's, he's living his dream. So, um, you know, we're, we're about the same thing that you guys are just trying to share the message, helping people get outdoors that really have nowhere, no idea where to start. So. That's very cool. You guys are actually the, the, the perfect audience that we had when the perfect audience. You're the, you're the audience that we had in mind when perfect. Yes, we know we're perfect. Yes. When we when we, when we had our, our first um, series, the Turkey Hunting for Beginners, because you know, like we, we talked about, and it's funny you mentioned Meat Eater because it was Steve Ronella that I recall hearing say that hunting is predominantly a patrilineal pursuit. You know, we grow up with fathers and uncles and stuff like that. And there's an awful lot of people out there that don't have that type of experience. And where do you start? The hunting shows we watch, to Carlin's point, are all all out of reach. You know, they're guys oh, that yeah. just go out in the woods and they're, you know, they're shooting moose and shooting, you know, massive animals. It's like, well, it, it, is that realistic for somebody, you know, in downtown Toronto who wants to go out and hunt? And that's uh, that's why we totally. started that turkey hunting series for beginners. So it's kind of refreshing to hear. And <laughs> my kids, <laughs> I read your article today in the uh, Gray Sporting Journal, and the way you talk about turkeys being um, not bambified and how mm-hmm. they weren't cute and cuddly, and you know nobody goes to grows up you know with a, a stuffed turkey that they climb into to bed with, so they're easier to shoot, and it's easier for non hunters to sort of embrace turkey hunting as a culture versus something that's a little uh, cuter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, it's a, totally. As somebody who lives in a city, it's a conversation you have very often when people find out you hunt. Mm-hmm. And I say this, I always get this really disappointing question: is like, well, do you eat the meat? It's like, yeah, like, duh. <laughs> That's the whole point of this, right? No, I'm a psycho who just kills things yeah, for fun. I just like, go out. <laughs> but, but people really don't understand that sort of full process. But you can make it really easy for them when you choose an animal that they eat and that arrives with its organs in its body from the store, right? Like <laughs> neck, tur- like no, neck, right? Heart, you know, you're making gravy out of it. It's the whole deal. And so- when you say you turkey hunt, people only associate turkeys with food, I think, in general. I mean, unless there are people who have a, like a very deep spiritual affinity yeah. to turkeys, I, like in general, <laughs> people don't have really- I'm not aware any, of any cultures that honor like the turkey god. <laughs> <laughs> I think turkeys are beautiful, but That's they also kind of look like hell. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? Like they're just, they don't have that sort of fuzzy, soft, big-eyed um, Disney character. The fur um, factor. Yeah. And, and, you know, even some birds, right. I th- like, you know, pe- people have different feelings about ducks than turkeys, I think, or non hunters, even geese, right. Like um, Toronto, especially Canada. Geese, and and so, so I've always found turkey hunting a really good way to talk about hunting in general, because it really allows you to talk about food, which is, I think when people get that piece, they're like, Oh, okay. Okay. Most people then are interested. That usually captures their interest. And then as I wrote in the article, what, at that time, they were very disappointed to hear after my big talk about turkeys and turkey hunting is that I hadn't even shot one <laughs> at that time. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah we're, all, we're all amped about hunting, we're watching media, everyone's like, man, so like, you must like do a lot of hunting and like get a lot of game meat. It's like, no, not really. <laughs> no. <laughs> you know, I, haven't, I, haven't, you know, I haven't done it yet. Yeah. But the important yeah. thing, I think about meat eater, like there's a critical point, Mike, that I think what Ian's trying to get with his audience too, is the thing that attracted us guys about meat eater wasn't so much well one was the production value because like let's face it most hunting shows have like pretty garbage hunting like production value it's like bad rock music intro like bad cuts and it had like really good production but it was that there was this guy who was kind of you know same age as us a little bit older really well spoken you know he's a writer and i felt like i could relate to this guy from michigan near ontario i was like man this guy like i can i I can associate more with him with some of those other shows and there's some Canadian ones, like I just couldn't relate to it. I was like, I don't know. Like these guys are kind of just to me, they were rednecks. I don't think like that obviously now, but when I were pre hunting, I was like, these guys are like rednecks. But then I saw Steve talking and I was like, Oh, this guy's really smart. And you know, like he's really well-spoken and I didn't know that that's a thing with hunting. And I think that's, that's what we have to change is the perception that hunting is just, again, like this, you know, whatever redneck kind of, you know, barbaric thing. And there's actually really smart people who do it. And I think Steve's a great ambassador and Mike for doing that, you know? 
And you guys. Uh, and you guys also. And that's, uh, I think that there are a lot more of us um, than we realize that are out there, but we're not, you know, um, I guess in the, the public's eye. And hunt, hunters in general really do have a, a, a PR problem. You know, people, as soon as you, you know, oh, you're a hunter, you don't look like the hunter. You don't look like the stereotypical image that they have in their, um, in, in their mind of, you know, just a, I don't know, people out there fulfilling bloodlust, you know, we're, we're <laughs> drinking we're beer. Mm. Well, well no, we do, exactly. we do drink the beer though, to be fair. Yeah, I, mean, I know. On camera. <laughs> uh, yeah. But like hunters yeah. are like the most disorganized, organized group of people, you know, Yes. <laughs> like really like they're yeah, so they're organized better. right like and we fight with our dollars and we lobby our mps and do all this shit but then it's like let's get together and form a collective body to like voice our things and like we don't do it like there's no real like except for ofa it just it's weird right it's a very it's very bizarre to me how that still is still a problem you know i don't know it just it's it, i don't get it how we just yeah, i know this, this topic comes up uh, I think it's come up in every single one of the podcasts that we've done too. So uh, yeah. I'm interested, uh, Mike and Liam, about the conversations you have with people in Toronto about hunting. What is their reaction? Is, is it, uh, oh, you know, oh, you're a hunter, you kill things? Um, or do you choose the people that you spread the news about uh, hunting? Or no, I, I, Not anymore. I, yeah, <laughs> I, tell, I tell everybody. Yeah, I and, tell everybody. Yeah. And, and you know what? in general the 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 usual response is interest actually yeah um, i agree I'd agree. it's not uh, including amongst friends of mine who are vegetarians mm -hmm. um even vegans huh? yeah i don't think i have any friends who are vegan that's right i imagine that might be a more difficult conversation but <laughs> <laughs> i've had it and some of them are like that's really interesting and i was like oh that's not how i would like is, to do, you know <laughs> I have the benefit of having thought about this a lot. And so, and I've approached this conversation and I always start with food because mm -hmm. as soon as I think the, the, the major intellectual hurdle that you have to um, jump when you deal with sort of people who are raised in an urban environment or otherwise aren't exposed to hunting is they see it's hunting is about killing for its own sake or killing for some antlers or for a trophy and they don't understand that that's like just such a small like piece of the whole puzzle, even though right. it's a necessary piece. Right. Um, I've had one or two negative reactions as you might just, I think that's just odds, but they've never been really severe. And, you know, I doubt I would, I can't even remember who it was. So I obviously don't care too much about it. <laughs> what they I don't remember. Um, but yeah, I think you'd be surprised how, how positively people listen to you about hunting if you talk about it in a way that you're thoughtful you know like i think people wouldn't be really excited to hear about you talking about the large numbers of ducks you shot for example like right. this is like talking about ambassadorship for hunting and this goes for all types of hunting you know whereas amongst hunters we understand like to to limit out on a day in ducks means you did everything right and so you're, you're reveling in the totality of your success as opposed to just the big pile, but all they see is the pile. The Even pile, the term yeah. pile, I don't love. Yeah, like yeah, stacking. You know what I mean? I don't like that word. <laughs> you know, no, like, I don't. I don't. I really show don't us like, your pile. I don't yeah, like, do you know I don't what I mean? like, like it. Just the whole, yeah. it, 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 it sounds... Like Even though it's not, and I know from inside, from someone outside, that kind of language, using that kind of language is like sounds to them very disrespectful. And right. we know, yeah. like I know lots of people who talk about killing a pile of ducks and I don't care. Like I know what they mean. Yeah, it doesn't I know what me. their motivations are, but like for people who don't know about hunting, that's why I kind of approach it from a food first perspective because people get that, especially urban people. They really get that. There's a huge movement, not just cities, but everywhere. They're like, where's this food coming from? Who grew it? Yeah. How, how good is it? And so I say to them, look, like I take responsibility, like personal responsibility for some of the meat that I, eat. and I'm very comfortable with that. Like I don't, and, and, I'm willing to talk to them like realistically about it um, without sugarcoating it. And so most people are, you know, they're cool. And, and even my, you know, my vegetarian friends are, are down. Yeah, they're still friends with me. They still come to my house, man. Yeah. Have a more in, uh, intimate relationship with your food, you know, and that's, uh, um, well, even vegans having their own gardens, there is a similarity there, um, you know, where they, 
they know exactly where their their food has been from a seedling to their their dinner plate you know being mm-hmm. able to go out into the woods and find you know game meat that's n- never had you know a steroid or a growth hormone or been kept in a pen and treated poorly you know and that's uh, the fact that we are willing to take responsibility for that I guess the the killing part of it because it is it is killing. I know we we tend to you know we talk about you know harvesting a turkey or you know we're not, we're not it's murder we're killing it you know <laughs> it's <is laughs> not murder <laughs> whatever the, uh, the, 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 the maybe not in the uh, biblical sense but oh, you yeah, know the biblical sense it's not even the criminal code sense <laughs> no but Ian here's the thing right for the longest time there was a cognitive dissonance between people and their food right but hunting and the internet and really the internet has changed that and now it's hard to ignore that cognitive dissonance because of the overwhelming information that's available online, right? Like it's the average person. They know what happens in a slaughterhouse now versus 30 years ago, people weren't filming with their phones inside of slaughterhouses, seeing right. like the shit that goes on there and like the brutal conditions, right? So <laughs> that's probably the best thing that ever happened to hunting. No, honestly, like that, that there was this, uh, what do they call it? Like, you know, uh, a gag or those type of investigative journalists. And now pe- people know that, you know, the food chain is like a messed up thing and hunting is, just the same as like the hundred kilometer diet. It's the same kind of movement. And I think that's something, you know, hunters need to embrace and not just make jalapeno popper doves, you know, <laughs> <laughs> like, come on guys, <laughs> you know, like, you know, let's, let's get inside the Although, box. Like if you want to bring some over, like, I yeah, but like, Carla, you me I'll some, take some I, right now. I have never, I have never been dove hunting. I want to do that very, very bad. I've been unsuccessfully. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but like start. I watched a, a guy shooting pigeons. It was a hunt cook show. That's cool. Um, where was it? Maybe in Spain, and they were shooting barn barn pigeons, and they fed the whole family, and and it, it was quite the good looking feast. Anyway, so I got to try that one. I had some delicious stuff. wood pigeon on my honeymoon in Italy. They because wood pigeon there are are like shot regularly because they're a crop pest and they're yeah. extremely delicious. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, they're extremely um, delicious. Yeah. I want to circle back to the pile. Uh, um, more so trophies online, uh, pictures of, uh, well, we'll start with the pile. So, you know, go out and get your limit in geese, ducks, a uh, big pile of uh, birds on the ground, hunters behind. And I've been there. I've been behind the piles and, you know, arm around my son or around my buddy. It's a proud moment for hunters. Mm-hmm. Um, but I can also see the other side. You know, we, we were talking about uh, people in the city that, that don't understand, um, I guess, what it means to us and, and the amount of work and research and time and money it takes to go out and make that pile. So what's the alternative? You know what? I actually don't think the alternative is not taking the photo, frankly. I think I kind of do expect some level of resilience in others. Yep. And and for all the reasons you just discussed, I think if people don't like it, some part of me says, too bad. Yeah, but, look. but part of me, don't look quite right. But part mm-hmm. of me also thinks that as hunters, and especially in a sport that is like a in a minority of persons and like, I think is overall declining. We also have a responsibility to like finish that sentence. So you might, you might, as your next photo, put a picture of the food that you made with that pile. Uh, Do you know or the I work mean? you did setting up in the morning with your son, right? Or, or right. you, or you cap, or you think about the caption you're going to add to it. Yeah. But I wouldn't say don't post the picture because that doesn't help anybody. And I don't think you can sugarcoat it. I think it's, mm. I'm talking about the way you talk about it, I suppose, and the way right. you treat it. Yeah. I don't do a lot of, um, we don't do a lot of grip and grin stuff, but we do. I've, I've got, there's a photo there with me of my first turkey and Liam with the last time we were able to turkey hunt together out for several County with a turkey. And then me with some asparagus that I harvested because I didn't get a turkey. <laughs> um, Good asparagus. <laughs> so like i don't i don't know i think to some extent people just need to under like to live with it but it's 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 it it, it can de- it you have to accept that you are definitely going to turn some people off unless you can do some other stuff to say like here's the whole story yeah i, I would agree and 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 that's fine like you're going to turn people off in life all the time it's, whether it's you realize like, it or not so yeah. yeah right just be authentic like you know just present an authentic story and right. people who are interested in that will probably see it for what it is and 
they'll follow and they'll probably comment and people who don't that's that's no one's problem it's it, it, that's just the nature of social media and, and being an adult right but yeah, at the I same time of bullshit on social media that i'm like this is the dumbest thing i've ever seen I'm yeah but mike again. <laughs> mike there needs to be there needs to be a little bit of deference to again just just knowing when to maybe not post some of that stuff because again many of these accounts it's just like constant like we're stacking limits and it's just like listen to, to all things you know there is there's like you can moderate all things right so just maybe you post like a really nice single duck you know that was i got banded wood duck like that that in and of itself is a beautiful thing right, right. i remember that mike got a photo of sasha with a really nice wood duck that he shot on his dad's island and you know that's awesome like we didn't we didn't shoot a limit of wood ducks but like he shot this beautiful duck and it was in this this cool place and you have to again you have to just provide a variety of content because again there's a variety of audiences and you'll you'll find content that people with different audiences like and they'll gravitate towards you but if you're putting out the same content right you're probably only going to attract those people who like that content and that's what's going to hinder us as hunters right so it's about it's about just embracing you know change really i think <laughs> well i mean i think it's about the the respect factor Mm-hmm. And if you're respecting the game that you're pursuing and, you know, treating it properly in the field, treating it properly in the kitchen, you know, giving it, you know, treating it with the deference that, that it deserves versus, uh, you know, treating it poorly. Like the, uh, the, one of the um, wild TV episodes, it was when wild TV first became available. I remember watching it and there was a guy from Calabogi that had a, a show and he was actually pouring beer into the open beak of a Canada goose that he killed. And I remember looking at that going, oh my God. Oh my God. <laughs> How is it that this guy's got a, a show, you know, and that, uh, you know, the, then, then you learn anybody with the video camera and funds can buy their way onto a, onto a TV show. And that's uh, one of the things that I, I really do like about what, what you guys are doing is, is demonstrating that respect. That that's a uh, that's a very cool thing. Yeah, but like you know what? At the end of the day, and I I think that's right. Like th- what you're talking about, though the, the 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 respect part, people don't. It doesn't show in a photo. No, no. Like that's the challenge. The challenge I think we have as hunters to communicate with non-hunters, in particular. I don't know if it's particularly urban-based non-hunters, but those are certainly the ones that I communicate with. Is I wouldn't. I know I wouldn't be successful in having them view me positively if that's all I expose them to. Like I'm, I'm mm-hmm. confident, but that doesn't mean that if that's what you're most proud of and that's what you put want to put out there for your friends and family, put it out there. I don't think there's anything wrong with it, but if you're, if, but if the question is, how do I bring these people on side? I think real life is that it's going to have to include more than just like pile photos. And mm-hmm. I got a pile. I, I can think right now on our social media, there's one of me and Liam, uh, standing like arms crossed like this, and there's like a big <laughs> whack, of, <laughs> whack of geese in front of us. But I also take p- pictures of like goose, goose-based meals that I cook, and I, I put it on our on my store. In fact, we have more pictures of food, probably probably food and outdoor nature things. Right? Yeah, and Breakfast. maybe this is because we're shit hunters, so we don't have enough files, man. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's yeah. Listen, don't talk about that. That's You're gonna have to invite us out. We got. We need, <laughs> we got yeah, no. <laughs> just start. Just start with the end in mind, right? What's the end goal? What do you want to achieve? And if that's to get more people to like you, then yeah, just you know try a variety of content and yeah, food just seems to be this like universal language that everyone loves to talk about. Right. It's how many cooking shows are there? You know, millions, probably how many cooking shows are there? Maybe hundreds, yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> you know? So what does that tell you? Right. That's funny. I don't think that I, uh, I, w- I would encourage everybody to take photos. Like, those are the memories, you know, mm-hmm. and that's a, that's, that's what you are doing this. I think that the, the posting of stuff on, social media for public consumption is a, uh, I don't know if, if it's a fad, but I don't, uh, I don't know that that's necessarily the reason we should be taking those pictures, but I would encourage everybody to continue taking those pictures and retaining those memories. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with that. I agree. And like the reality is you can, you were still allowed to enjoy a picture just for yourself. <laughs> you know? Yeah. It, it still happened just because it's not, not to everybody get a thousand knows likes. about it. <laughs> And now you can't even see the number of likes. It doesn't matter. I know. If nobody likes it, now. it's yeah. like the new tree falls in a forest paradigm. If nobody liked the photo, did the event even occur? Yeah. <laughs> Listen, if you, if you really want to accomplish this goal, here's what you do. You invite a bunch of people over to your house for dinner and you cook them the wild turkey that you shot 
And don't even tell, well, you know. No, I usually uh, tell uh, them. Yeah, it depends on the person, but tell them most of the time. And then tell them the story and then tell them, you know, whose farm it was and what that farmer does. And like, th- like that's interesting. People want to, you know, people want to learn about that. When I tell people that I we used to shoot turkeys down in like Norfolk County on this guy's cherry f- apple farm, they're like, that's, that's so cool. Like, who is this guy? You know, where'd you go? Like, the whole, you know, the whole experience is that's what people want to hear about. And that's how you can get people interested. And then, you know, maybe you did it a couple of times and one buddy's like, Hey man, can I come just like watch your hunt? And I've had that. And I took a, a buddy out last year and he's like, I just want to sit and like watch this. And then the turkey gobbled and he lost his mind <laughs> and I had to calm him down. Like I could feel his heart breaking through his chest beside me. And he's like, you were, you didn't tell me it was going to be like that. I was like, I can't prepare you for it. So you know, a year later, he just, he just literally just messaged me. He's like, I just got my new, like a uh, knock on quiver release for my bow. You know, he's like, I'm super excited to go turkey hunting. And I was like, sweet, but I didn't push him to hunt. Right. I just said, Here's I've introduced doing. two people to hunting the same, not through, not through turkey hunting, but actually through taking them clay shooting. Yeah. And you yeah. first get them comfortable with, cause another hurdle that people gateway drug <laughs> clay shooting, <laughs> the marijuana of the hunting don't... world. <laughs> a thing that people don't think about about and it does sound stupid but like pe- like guns scare people and it's not like i don't think they should i've got yeah. five in my basement mike this is a great that. point because this but is the like, bigger conversation in toronto but but like habituating people to using firearms as tools rather than seeing them as like scary violence um con- creating weapons is actually a thing that that really helps so i have taken Three, pe- three people who I've taken clay shooting, all like urban-based people, all of them got their firearms licenses. Two of those three I have hunted with since then. Mm, awesome. So, um, Only four and a half million to go. Hey, man. <laughs> no, but Mike, the Mike's on to something because like, that's the bigger, scarier conversation with urban people. It's not about hunting. It's about the firearms. That's the real, that's the real underlying issue, right? Is that they're, they're really probably not comfortable with firearm like ownership and discussion now in Toronto, right? Like we're potentially going to ban handguns. We'll see, you know, but um, that's what people probably, that's what people are really actually more afraid of. It's not, they don't really care about hunting. I don't think about, they, they, and they, they, they eat dead animals already. So that's not the issue. The issue is that they're like saying they're scared of guns and they're scared of what it represents. Right. Right. When I get a negative reaction to hunting, the first question I ask, if I feel like it's getting out of hand, is I look at them and say, look, you eat meat. Yeah. My other favorite one is how do you figure deer die? in the wild <laughs> do you think they are lying in bed with some candles lit surrounded by their friends and family they just go to sleep mike or <laughs> or, or 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 you figure that they are either shot by a hunter hit by a car die of starvation die of hypothermia drown or eaten guts up alive those are their options and i present a very good option <laughs> like <Yeah. laughs> the most full option really yes the most humane <laughs> that doesn't you know a vegan will say to you, well, that animal desired to, to continue to live. And if you ask, it would probably not seek to be killed. And that is true. That's something that I have sort of reckoned with and that. can accept. But I also accept that others can't accept that. Um, but turkeys, turkeys make the conversation easier. And like, just let's take it right back to turkeys because people see them almost as like a ceremonial animal to eat. They usually truck a turkey out <laughs> at, at an event at uh when you're feeding a lot of people around a table and so so to and so and it's really seen only as food but it's still understood to be an animal especially because it's served whole and so I, that's why i like to start with with turkeys and i like to start talking turkey hunters with beginners because aside from the access problem which we can talk about turkey hunting is is very challenging but also relatively accessible that is such a funny point. It's never occurred to me until right now, but everybody's familiar with that WKRP episode where they're throwing the turkeys out of the airplane and Les Nesman is, you know, I swear to God, I thought turkeys could fly. You know, <laughs> it's, a, it's a bit of a leap, but imagine if they were doing that with furry animals. That would have been taken off the air and, you know, yeah, I mean, the world funny, would hate WKRP today, you know. <laughs> turkeys people can tolerate for, for somehow but you, see, you guys don't just hunt birds like um well you know i in, in fact liam I, I know you and i have talked about uh about bears and deer and oh, other, man. Other, other things not a bad bear experience this year but we won't get into it but yeah bear deer <laughs> i mean mainly birds though because again it's just like it's easy it's it's relatively simple compared to again like you know you shoot a bear or a deer that's when the work starts right so 
and I, and like as Steve says, Renault, like they're charismatic megafauna, right? Like they're we associate them with more with humans, right? Like they're more human like, you mm-hmm. know. So people have a stronger yeah. affinity towards them. And the thing about bird hunting that like that Mike always says is like you can just you can <laughs> you can get in like a Honda Civic, you can go bird hunting, right? Like <laughs> no, you can like you can roll into a, like the edge of a field, right? Take take a turkey blind and your gear and walk into the woods and like you can pull it out, you know? Like it, there's there's very low barrier to entry. Right. Like you don't need a lot of gear. You don't need a truck to go turkey hunting. Right. Maybe, well, most of, most of the time, or maybe, you know, a buddy who has a truck, you can go and, and carpool with him. Like it's very, very low setup cost, under 500 bucks, basically. Right. And then with a gun, maybe a thousand bucks. And like Mike said, it's, it's, it's challenging, but it's not like, like Ian, you're a really good turkey hunter. Okay. You're really good. Like I've, I've hunted with you. You're, you're probably one of the best turkey hunters I've ever hunted with. But, to be like a really amazing deer hunter, right? When you're a good deer hunter, but to be a really mm-hmm. amazing deer hunter, like that's a very unique skill set, right? Yeah. That's t- that takes a lot of time and patience and like a lot of hours logged. Like really, when you think about it, and I think just turkey, it's just it, it's like the fun of the big game hunting, but it's condensed into a much shorter learning curve, <laughs> really, right? Yeah, and like yeah, we do we do hunt. Like I have, I've shot one deer, um, and that was a ma- an amazing experience and. Like I love the amount of meat that we get. Um, but actually one of the reasons I hunt birds is um, to, as this is hunt deer, especially if you want to do it in the gun season or even archery, like you're going to have to spend a lot of days in the field. And if you live in a city, it's a lot harder to like frequently, it's harder to scout. It's harder to spend that many days in the field when there's a lot of travel time tacked on. And I, I think also just, I'm constitutionally a little bit impatient. I like walking around. Yeah. I like hunting for a half a day like and noise. taking a break. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I'm not, um, I'm not as excited about sitting in a stand. Birds do um, tend to be more, I, more actionable. You know, like when, when you go duck hunting, you know, it's not like, well, did you see anything? You know, your chances are really good that you're going to shoot at least a couple of times. You might not get anything, but you're going to shoot a few times. You're definitely going to see stuff. And yeah. that's not the case when you go deer hunting. Yeah. <laughs> right. No, it's not. But it's also an opportunity issue as well. Um, there are fewer places to hunt deer near where I live. Like if if somebody sent to me, come to my deer camp and hunt deer with me this weekend, I'd be like, sign me up. I'm just going to set my rifle in and I'll be there. I love the meat. Um, I, I love the whole process. I love the camaraderie. Don't get me wrong. But it's a lot easier for me to put throat whack my dog in the car and pair of boots and a shotgun and go hunt grouse or throw in my turkey vest and go hunt turkeys it's a little bit um and i can be done i can hunt the morning and be back and and if i get a bird the processing i can do in an hour yeah you know, it's like a lot there's just it's just yeah. a lot um you know i make i make it sound like i'm extremely impatient i'm not i've learned a lot of patience from hunting <laughs> i'm pretty impatient um but but yeah birds are, birds is, uh, tend to be what we go after no. And and also what I me and Mike always recommend to everybody who gets new into hunting who's from the city is like go and actually like pay for some guided hunts. Mm-hmm. Cuz you not number one it's fun, number two you learn a lot, right? And number three, it's like, you know, you're you're <laughs> you're stacking the deck in your favor for success, but if you're in Toronto within a 2 hour drive pretty much all directions like you can get a decent guide who will take you duck or goose hunting, right? And you'll probably get, you know, a decent amount of, of, of action and birds and have fun and you go with your buddies and you make a day of it. And like, that's awesome. And that's what I think that's going to help hunting more than anything else is like supporting guides and supporting local communities and hunters and, you know, stopping and getting gas and buying food in those towns. And, you know, like that's, that's what we need. And, and as like casual urban hunter, it's very easy to do. And like Mike said, you can be, you know, you leave at like five, you're back at five, right. It's pretty, it's pretty simple. You're not spending a week at a deer camp, right. It's like and it is interesting when you think about it in, in those terms because even by you know paying a guide I think a turkey guide is about 250 bucks a day maybe 300 yeah. you know and that's uh, when you think about how much you'd spend on a golf membership or you know a lift ticket at a at a ski resort you know being able to go out and spend a couple hundred dollars to spend a, a, a really high quality day um, in the field is, is not it's, it's not a, a ridiculous step but it's not something that I think that occurs to an awful lot of people. And you're going to fast forward your learning. Oh because, yeah. And like, especially for someone like me who really learns by doing, like you can tell me how to do something all you want, but I like to do it myself. And that way I actually like it, the lesson sticks. And 
so for turkey hunting for example knowing where you're supposed to be sitting what is a call supposed to sound like when are they calling with what cadence when do they decide decide to get up and move how are they scouting like those and and most guides uh, we i haven't had a turkey guide well i sort of have because when we've hunted up with 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 um you know mark and the go hunt birds guys when you're hunting with some of those guys it's like having a guide because they're so experienced so you learn from them but most people are really happy to answer all your dumb questions yeah, like, i love it why are you calling now yeah why are you doing x what do you where do you think the turkeys are going to be coming from where do you think they're roosted like most people are really interested, like as long as you're not like loudly talking when you're supposed to be shutting up so you can <laughs> see the birds. Moving all around. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's one thing to watch stuff on YouTube. It's one thing to read articles. That's all extremely useful. Uh, YouTube videos in particular. In fact, I watched a- Yeah, I, you can learn a lot about turkey calling. One of your guys' videos, pheasant hunting. Um, what is the property out in southwestern Ontario? I'm sorry, I've had such a long work day that my mind. Was what that the out. Norfolk County pheasant? No, least? not Norfolk uh, County. We have a couple, so we consider James series in Hullet. Yeah, oh Hullet, yeah, Hullet. That's Hullet. the one. Hullet, yeah, yeah. Hullet. That's I drove great. out there this year, and I was like, oh, I wonder what the terrain. You know, just just a tip for people who are learning, including learning how to turkey hunt. I thought I'd never been to Hullet, but I knew I was going to go. I knew there were pheasants there. I thought to myself, I wonder what kind of terrain they're finding pheasants in. Like, what does it look like? Mm. What does the habitat actually look like on the ground? <laughs> that's how I, that's how I, and I watched you guys hunt the same with turkeys. When you watch turkey hunting videos, I think people should try and find ones that aren't in like a, you know, oak timber in Georgia. <laughs> if, if you actually live in Ontario and are hunting field edges with cedar swamp, right. like See if you can find some people who are relatively near you or hunting the same terrain and look at where they are shooting the birds. Think about what time of day it is. How are they set up? Like those are the things to pay attention to. Just walking tur turkey videos willy nilly. Like as a wonderful as Steven Ranella is, watching him shoot a turkey in Montana probably isn't going to help you very much to shoot a turkey here <laughs> or not yeah, as much. Yeah, as yeah, watching, yeah you know. you're right. No, you're right. From a, from a learning perspective, that is interesting. And going back to, to I know where both Carlin and I started, where you literally, you've got a call, you've got your camouflage, you go out in the woods and, you know, just start trying. But by the, you know, the end of your third season and you haven't got a turkey, it's like, oh my God, you know, yeah. if I could have watched a YouTube video that helped put some of those pieces together um, and, you know, condense that learning curve, what a game changer the internet is for people today. Holy smokes. Hugely, hugely. And yeah. I consider that all part of e-scouting, to be honest. E -learning. I consider watching, <laughs> yeah, I consider watching YouTube videos, especially like there are people who from this province who like video their hunts. And you can see, oh, like that's where they were finding grouse. Like that's what it looked like in there. Oh, interesting. Oh, that's where, that's the kind of structure they're fishing for bass. Like it's a, it's a really incredible resource. So it's more than Google Maps, man. I think, I think e-scouting is everything. I think it's, I think it's boards uh chat boards or grouchy people don't tell you any information <laughs> there's all kinds of <laughs> no but kinds yeah but my guess that's listen that's one part of the battle right like the thing is you also have to put yourself out there if you want to if you want to hunt like in in toronto like as in you want to be a hunter in toronto and access properties elsewhere you're you're gonna have to be an extrovert and you're gonna have to you know, ask for permissions and, and find people. Like you can't just sit there and expect it to come to you. Right. And oh yeah, for sure. I mean, unless a, you want to hunt yeah. some of the sort of limited, there are some public land areas. There right. are public land, land land areas. I don't want to just limit ourselves to Ontario, but I agree. You know, one of the challenges of turkey hunting is like, where do you find them a lot of the time? Like ag land. And that's privately owned. And so unless you know somebody who wants to bring you out and thankfully we do, Large, we know a lot like various people who have you know generously offered to uh, take us hunting with them like you know liam liam through a friend of his managed to secure us a permission on a farm that's relatively near here and that's amazing and every year and we have a great relationship with the with the property owner and we bring our tribute of a of alcohol every year <laughs> <laughs> we, you know we try and respect the property and 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 um yeah, it's it's great, but that I'd like to hear your guys' perspective on this actually, Carla and Ian. Like, what do you say to people in terms of property access? Because that really is the primary it's, barrier. It's it. If I had a property that I knew I could hunt all the time, the rest you can figure out. You can get yourself a shotgun, you can get yourself a vest, you can get some calls, 
but you don't have anywhere to use any of that stuff, you're kind of dead in the water. And I think that's mm -hmm. what really puts the brakes on a lot of people's aspirations. Other than than public land, you know, your <clears throat> that is exactly your uh, your option is to um, get and seek permission. And it's a you know, as a, a career salesperson, you know, I uh, spend an awful lot of time knocking on doors. I got used to people saying no, you know, long long time ago. Yeah. So you know, walking up and knocking on a farmer's door, um, you know, and. Like there, there, there's a fear and a discomfort for a lot, of, a lot of uh, people that 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 aren't extroverted or just don't don't like doing that sort of thing. But you've got to do it. And you know what? I found that uh, when you knock on the door and somebody's there, if they realize that you're just you know a respectful person that's not going to be out there doing bad things to their property, more often than not, I think you're going to find that if unless they're anti-hunter or um, the land is already locked up by other hunters. They're going to let you go, you know, a hundred percent, give you a chance. You know, uh, some people do have, uh, have had bad experiences where guys in trucks have torn up fields and, you know, left beer bottles and beer cans and, you know, just been, you know, idiots on the, on the properties. And then the guys are like, no, you know what? I tried that once and yeah, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't allow it anymore, but. Um, I think the biggest obstacle, depending on your your area, is going to be the fact that other people have the properties locked up. I think in a in a lot of cases, um, trust and respect, like Ian mentioned, are, are things that you can build over time with with uh, landowners. I'll, I'll give you an, a, an example. Um, we were hunting public land two years ago, and we shot a a, a big buck and a and a doe and the doe was, you know, the doe went down right there, but the buck uh, ran across the field where we didn't have permission. So um, we went, we spoke to the, the landowner and they said, oh, you know, thanks so much for coming to ask. And yeah, you have permission to go in and, uh, um, you know, retrieve your buck wherever that was. And, and that was probably one of the worst retrievals we ever had. It was, a, I think it was 20, 20 uh, degree slope down to a river oh. and, and I, I'm not sure how I survived that. There was five of us there that pulled this deer up and anyway, but um, you know, I think we keep going back to that same person every year and saying, Hey, you know, remember us, we were the people <laughs> that uh, For me? had to go and extricate this deer out of the, the river Valley. But I think over time, you know, they're going to understand that we're, we are respectful of their land. We're not on there being cowboys and, you know, ripping it up and, or just going on there simply uh, hunting without permission. Uh, ironically, while we were asking permission to go retrieve our deer, there was another group of hunters because we could, it was a shotgun season. So we could see them coming across the field. They were coming across the field at us and um, we asked, Hey, you know, do you let anybody else hunt here? And they said, no. So, <laughs> you know, I think it, it may take some time for people, you know, Ian and I are fortunate. We have a, uh, a lot of land around here that, that we can hunt and, uh, and we're the only ones that have that, that privilege on that piece of land. And it's simply because we are, we are trustworthy and respectful to that landowner. And well, I grew up with them, so that helps too. So. <laughs> no, but Ian yeah, made a good point. Start. You just got to get yourself out there. Like if you're in yeah. the city and the first place that we ever turkey hunted was a farm down in, in Norfolk County, like near Simcoe. And and literally I just got on the phone one day. I looked on Google, I looked up all the farms like that I could drive to. I just called, I think I called like 20 or 30 people. And finally this guy picked up and he's like, hello. <laughs> like, hey, I saw your farm online. <laughs> I want to come on, <laughs> come on turkeys, right? Uh, and he's like, cool. He's like, yeah, drive down and talk to me. And like, you know, bring the OFA form, right? Oh, by the way, if you're getting into hunting in Toronto, join OFA. Awesome. You get liability insurance and then you can tell all these farm owners that, Hey, I already have liability insurance. I'm an OFA member. If anything happens, you're protected. Really, some, really... some, some landowners require it. Um, yeah. so most do, should... right? Yeah. Like now. Yeah. But just get it because you're supporting a great cause. It's awesome. Yeah. And you know, I went and chatted with him and I was like, he's like, Oh, you seem like a cool dude. And you know, that's cool. Here's where you can go. Here's where you can't go. Right. Like he gave me the, the permissions, gave me like the, gave us the boundaries. And we went there for a, for a few good consistent years, right? Mike, we harvested a good amount of birds and, had some fun times and a couple of we, rabbits too. A couple of rabbits, another, you know, messed around. And then didn't really go there for a while, but every year I'd just call him or email him to check in and see how he's doing, right? Like wish him Merry Christmas, that kind of stuff. And then last year, um, there's a point to the story. Last year, I I was like just needed to get a bird. 
And I was like, you know what? Like, man, I'm just gonna go to Brett's place. Uh, oh, sorry, I shouldn't say his name. Whatever. Uh, I'm gonna go to Brett's. There's more than one guy named Brett who owns a farm. <laughs> and, and he's like, yeah, man. He's, he's like, the permissions have changed a bunch. And me and Mike knew that, like he had done some like farm work and moved a bunch of stuff around. We're like, okay, I'll come down. And um, didn't really have any luck. And then a, a gentleman that we know, Andy Verco uh, of Dark Thirty Calls, Turkey Calls, amazing guy, was like, hey, man, I actually I saw a turkey on this other part of his property like on the border i was like oh sweet he's like do you want to go hunt it i was like cool and went and we scouted it and then um my buddy who had just gotten hunting missed it with his bow and then i shot it <laughs> and, and he was very bummed he was actually like the look on his face was one of utter heartbreak but i was just like man if i didn't have that connection if i hadn't nurtured it if i haven't you know respected brad and done that kind of stuff right i probably maybe not have had that experience and it's not like ian said like the worst thing people are gonna say is no you know, what's like, it's hard though. I have sympathy for it because I don't naturally, even though I'm extroverted, I don't love like going up and bugging people. Right. But to find the person, your group, you gotta be it. uncomfortable. Find the Ian of your group. Okay. Yeah. Who's, yeah. Or the Liam or the, the Mark. I know I have, I have. Right? Yeah. You have. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> but find that person. Right. And that's the other thing. If you're going to get into this, it's a pretty lonely affair if you're doing it by yourself. So try and find some buddies in Toronto who maybe want to, you know, or maybe, maybe your buddy's cousin already hunts. Right. And like, you know, just, just find a little group, a little ragtag group and, go kind of do it together and their strength in numbers. And I think that's the secret is again, it's just like we're talking about. It's about, it's about the power of, of, of numbers and group, right. And, and coming together and you got to drive a lot. It's easier to split gas. Everything just becomes easier and it's just more fun to fail together. Right, Mike? In yeah, our, yeah. Uh, in our Turkey hunting for beginners series, we talk about scouting and landowner permission in the same, uh, um, in the same segment because they do really, really go hand in hand. You know, you can get permission on a farm, but if that farm doesn't hold birds, your turkey hunting is going to be, you know, a, a, a boring and lonely affair, you know, and in the, in the winter, um, driving around those areas um, and using binoculars, spotting scopes, whatever, just, just looking in the fields, you know, when there's, there's snow on the ground, turkeys are pretty easy to spot, but if you can find turkeys in an area and then being able to, uh, to locate the, uh, the, the owners of those farms, that's a, I'll give a shout out to Onyx Hunt. What a, a fantastic program where, that will tell you where um, property boundaries are, what public land is available in that area. Wait, and Onyx is in Canada now? They, they added Canada? Well, I'm in New York right now. I don't know. Uh, good good no, question, actually. And if I they hunter. don't, somebody... I hunter. Do Get iHunter if you're in Canada. Get iHunter. Pay for the premium version. Pay for it. And get it. Give the guy your money. Don't ask questions. But I hundred doesn't give you the uh, sort of owner. Or I, know, I know. I think that maybe because of privacy legislation. Yeah. No. Yeah, good point. At the ultimately, the point is though, drive around, find properties that have the birds, and then knock on those doors. You know, you you had a a, a comment about showing up with your um, with your allotment of alcohol as a gift <laughs> for the property owner. And yeah, you know what, that stuff like that goes a long way. That is the type of thing that gets you invited back. I split an awful lot of firewood. I've moved hay for, you know, a lot to keep and maintain those relationships with farmers because there's a lot of competition out there. And if I'm not doing that type of thing, somebody that's, you know, younger, better looking, you know, has a kid, whatever with them, you know, they're going to wind up with flattered Ian. Thank you. Farm, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know what? Having babies when you guys getting landowner permission is going to be really easy. If you show up at a farm with a baby. Yeah. No one says no to a baby. <laughs> we'll walk up with little, little girls tottering beside us. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> the key with all of this is just like the, the key theme with all of this is you have to be okay with disappointment whether people say no to you whether it's not shooting a turkey right whether it's whatever you have to just be okay with it with with failing that's the key message here i think because the, the funny thing about hunting right you know people do think is oh it's you know if, if you just want to go out and, and you know kill a turkey and it's like you know what if i just wanted to have a turkey i can get one for like a dollar 39 a pound <laughs> yeah, yeah but you know yes but that's not the, like, I understand how people say that, right? Like I get, they, they know that too, right? Like they, they they know that it's just, yeah, it's, I think it's more of a weird moral thing, but again, just, just cook them it and be like, does this taste good? They're going to go. Yeah. It's awesome. Yeah. Right. Show them the results, right? Exactly. You know, people always like results. So let's give them the result. You know, like many time Mike we've ever given gave me to anybody, they usually love it. You know, I remember distinctly a moment you had a party in your backyard Maybe it was for your birthday. And we were eating venison burgers from the deer that I shot when we were in um, 
Wisconsin. In Wisconsin. And people, somebody says, says to Liam, Oh, Liam, this burger is amazing. <laughs> Liam points to me. He's like, yeah, like I shot it. <laughs> like I shot the deer. <laughs> I shot your burger. <laughs> I guess my, my cousin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just get people. Yeah. And, and it's like, it's just like the thing that I've noticed with getting people into like buddies into hunting is I, I have one buddy who got into bow hunting. Um, and he's almost as much into like the bow aspect right like because it's very meditative and all that kind of stuff right and the other guy got into it more because he just like he just likes collecting gear and hunting he's like i get to buy all this gear right and it's that's his thing so there's going to be a different reason for everybody right mike likes you know getting up early and having a diner breakfast and driving for four hours like mike likes that a lot right everyone everyone has their own thing you know like and for some people too like for me and mike i think it's as much a stress relief as is anything am I, right mike yeah. yeah yeah man i mean listen i think i think there's a lot I think what Ian is saying is like, if I, if all I cared about was the, all, if all I cared about was the meat I can buy. Like I, I buy meat. I only buy it from my local butcher yeah. because that I, I, you know, I'm paying for quality. I can, I know where it's from. It's I'm so supporting local farmers. Like, so that all makes me happy. But yeah, like there are, in fact, there's a lot of hunting that, you know, if I was told I could only hunt alone for the rest of my life like some people love it i'd be very disappointed because oh, thanks, yeah. a huge a huge part of hunting for me is the hang after is the and before. preparation before is the coffee in the middle of the, like having a coffee on the tailgate i think i have a photo of you ian making making coffee on on a tailgate and those those like little moments of camaraderie are really important to me like liam and i if we hunt up and together we'll usually like sit sit at, on the tailgate and have a beer at the end of the hunt um there's some i've been forced because of covid to do a lot of solo hunting this year and it was all grouse hunting and actually that was really great it was just me and the dog and when i'm working you know 12 or 14 hour days like to be able to just go out and you're just focused on that one thing and you're just on your own you're not talking to anybody um that is actually really nice but there is a lot to the process um that i think you know beginners and turkey hunting is the same thing man you get to sit and watch like there's no world in which I you'd like to think you would, but there is no world in which I would get my ass out of bed at three or three thirty in the morning and go and sit down on the wet ground and have like a mouse run over my boots. The rain. <laughs> and like you're sitting in there and it's like uh, you're climbing over gates and like you listen to the world wake up around you, like the animal world wake up around you. It really puts me in mind of there's like passage in um, Sand County Almanac where all the Leopold talks about the, the animals, like the, the sequence of bird calls, like who opens and like mm. who follows up. And that is really an experience you have um, turkey hunting. Like you hear those first birds, you hear the, 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 the like growing dawn chorus. It's amazing. And there's no world as amazing and wonderful and poetic as it is. My alarm went off and I wasn't turkey hunting. I'd be like, boop, and I'd go back. Yeah. To sleep. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. I still, I still am out there for a purpose. Um, and it's like that, so it's that whole, but you get all those wonderful benefits, like deriving from that purpose, you know? Oh, that's fantastic. It, uh, it really is a treat to, uh, to be able to, to reconnect with you guys and to, uh, to, to hear a little bit more of your philosophies and, and theories around hunting. I, uh, I think that you represent, um, the sport very, very well. And oh, thanks, man. Uh, I hope that Thank you, you. Uh, I hope that you guys continue to uh, to do so. We are on a uh, a bit of a clock. We asked for an hour from you guys. You've been very very generous with your time, and we appreciate it a lot. But but encourage anybody listening out there to uh, to check out um, Mike and Liam's um, the Urban Outdoorsman. You know you, uh, you can find them online. It's a quick Google. Do yourself a favor and Google Michael Finley in the Grays sportsman's journal um did i get that right mike it's good yeah it's great sporting journal yeah it's an article it's, uh, ago, amazing. Amazing. <laughs> i read a lot and uh, obviously read a lot of articles and stuff like that but that was one of the most entertaining articles about turkey hunting that uh, that i've ever read and anybody that's watched a turkey fly out of a, a tree and land in a field hear it uh or to to, to read it described as 
with all the grace of a half filled duffel bag being thrown down the stairs. <laughs> <laughs> it's true though, man. <laughs> yeah, that's very true. <laughs> and I, I literally laughed out loud. It was, it was just so good. But anyways, oh, guys, we, yeah, we do have to, uh, to, to wrap it up. And uh, again, thank you on behalf of the Canadian wild Turkey Federation. Yeah, you know, Let's plug the CWTF. Before yeah, we, well, I think that's super good group. Yeah. We, we, we talked about OFA and the, the insurance piece. Like I'm an insurance guys so that that piece really is huge but the canadian wild turkey federation the reintroduction efforts and the the i guess the, the property benefit piece that the money that goes into the cwtf is uh, it's just huge anybody that hunts turkeys in ontario um has to thank the nwtf and the ministry of natural resources um, the Canadian Wild Turkey Federation started when the NWTF had to, to pull out and go back to the states, but it's the same people, just under a different under a different label. But that federation has done extraordinary things. Membership costs thirty five bucks. You get a twenty five dollar gift card from Bass Pro in return. So your membership costs you ten dollars. So yeah, it's an amazing deal. And look, let me sort of step back and ask, like, conservation. And hunting um, promotion doesn't happen automatically. Like it doesn't. No. You got to pay for it. You have to get it. If you don't want to do the advocacy, then you got to pay somebody else to do it. Yeah. And and there's no free lunch. Yeah. So yeah. so um, I I I try to be involved in all of the sort of membership organizations of the and like animal species that I hunt as well as OFA. And I really think it's, it's, it's valuable even just to connect with people. Um, you can, you can, I, now obviously we're not doing events, but um, using the example of another organization, I know many duck hunters who have met each other through Ducks Unlimited or Delta Waterfowl, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So um, the more people who are members of an organization like the CWTF and the more funds they have available, the more they're able to not only sort of promote turkey hunting and conservation, but also the more of a position they're in to do that kind of social stuff, right? Yeah. Um, so do it. It's not that much. 35 well, bucks. Nothing. Yeah. And if you, you know, it doesn't mean you have to, you know, donate 10 days to, uh, to working in fields or anything else. But, you know, there's a lot of people that are volunteers in the organization that are more than happy to do that. And it just, you know, it's a, a little bit of money out of our pocket to help, uh, to help fund some of those projects. So again, on, on behalf of the CWTF and uh, the Turkey Talk podcast. Really appreciate you guys donating some of your time and uh, hey, and it is a pleasure. I feel like we didn't talk enough about turkeys. I looking back, we got, <laughs> mm. we got deeply <laughs> philosophical turkey talk on, on a Thursday evening. Wait, we didn't talk next turkey, time. Mike. Next, next time. time, I'm happy oh, to talk to you guys. I love talking about. Hunting. We let's talk, let's talk at the end of turkey season let's and yeah. just talk yeah. about turkey yeah. hunting and just bore share everybody all those memories and you know <laughs> that uh, I was uh, just telling stories about uh, hunting with you, Liam. And that's uh, Super fun. Yeah. Oh my gosh. It's just great. Just great. Today was like the first warm day in Toronto, really. And I stepped, I stepped outside and like the first thing that hit me, the second that warm air hit me and I, I didn't see snow on the ground. I was like, ah, turkeys are soon. like, like it just like, ah, it's like a metaphysical experience. It's just like, ah, turkeys are soon. You know, <laughs> it wasn't like, Oh, I'm going to be on patios and like all that. It's just like turkeys, you know, it's, yeah. it's hard to describe to people. The way the way it takes over your brain, you know, it's almost like uh, it's almost like our rut. It's like this thing that happens to us once a year where we're like we just go kind of crazy for a little while because we're like, oh man, turkeys, we gotta get them. And it nope. sounds weird, but it's there's an image. What's for that card? You. And that happens for me in many seasons. Yeah, I have one. <laughs> Practicing the I've dive from calling on a bike. <laughs> on the it's not a good plan, man. Somebody surprises <laughs> you. That thing's going right down the pipe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got to read the article to understand that. Uh, but again, I really I can't cool. recommend it. <laughs> all right, you guys, you know, we literally could do this all night, but uh, we are going to uh, wrap it up. So again, on behalf of the CWTF, uh, thank you so much. Um, Urban Outdoorsman, what a great idea. Great guys. Find them online, listen to their podcasts and, uh, you know, read the articles. So, um, Carlin, any, uh, any final thoughts? No, I think other than, uh, we got to do this again and, uh, you know, sure. for taking the time to come on here, uh, for people that, uh, that don't know what the CWTF is all about, please look them up. CWTF.ca. Mm -hmm. They need your support. 
this year, last year, more than ever, banquets have been shut down and that's where a majority yeah, of the funds come from. Um, you know, there's programs such as the, uh, the West Nile program where we're testing for uh, West Nile and grouse and, and turkeys and, you know, conservation efforts, uh, supporting kids like us, women like us programs across the, uh, across the, the country. These programs will suffer without the dollars. So please sign up today. But uh, I need to renew. Yeah. I think I need to renew my membership this year, actually. So I'm going to do that right now. This is a very now, timely. Now is the time they have. Uh, I just renewed. <laughs> yeah, the, there's the three gun uh, package. You can. Um, yeah, yeah. Enter, enter a raffle and yes. get your membership and Canadian Strutter Magazine. So yeah, it's it's, it's a good time. Absolutely. Be congruent. It's a lesson. Perfect. Thanks, guys. This is great. <laughs> Thanks, guys. From uh, Carl and Ian and the Real Outdoor Experience and the CWTF's Turkey Talk. Don't forget, always. Hey, keep it real, everybody. Thanks for staying with us. You have been listening to the Canadian Wild Turkey Federation's Turkey Talk podcast with your hosts, Carl and Ian from the Real Outdoor Experience. Tune in next time as we have an amazing lineup of both guests and subjects that span across the outdoors. Don't forget, get your kids outdoors. And always, keep it real.